is on our dame of parchach again o kaj somtasach sha mavrichas as in gora agus korarjachas lefer in museum de karach as na kanchna sha agro agus kamalashin as in taspontus simul a korshid osar gor uh, my role here is straightforward. Uh, you've come to hear about Liam Mellows and Pariko Malia from our two speakers uh, beside me, uh, Kermako Kori and Mihalo Faharte. And um, I was asked to make some contextualising remarks for 10, 12 minutes and uh, then to uh, chair the questions and answers uh, session at the end. Uh, so here goes. So, the Irish Civil War is remembered in uh, <coughs> the Irish language in one version as Coga na Garad, the War of Friends, and sometimes as the War of Brothers in English. Now, leaving aside the gendered aspect, this characterization of the conflict was present at its very beginning. The leading article in the Connacht Tribune on the 1st of July 1922 just a few days after the shelling of the Four Courts, was entitled Brother Against Brother, and it lamented, surely extremes of patriotism should not and cannot imply resort to fratricidal strife. And the article went on to predict, it must leave its inevitable trail of bitterness, which may sour the opening years of a land restored to nationhood after seven and a half centuries. It should be said that the Tribune, like almost all of the local and national papers, was firmly and outspokenly pro-treaty. Now, if the Tribune's focus on the 1st of July was on the dramatic events in Dublin, uh, a week later it had shifted closer to home. There were accounts of battles between pro- and anti-treaty forces for control of the Coast Guard station at uh, Costello, Cosla, and of the destruction of the railway bridge at Ross. There was a report of the burning of four premises in Galway on the 2nd of July, part of the Renmore Barracks, the police station in Eglinton Street, the Freemasons Hall and the Naval Station. This was the work of anti-treaty forces evacuating these buildings and retreating from the city. On the 3rd of July, a curfew was announced in Galway City in the following terms, quote, all persons are ordered to be in their homes from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. All public houses will close at 10 p.m. sharp. Any person attempting to burn or loot will be shot at sight. Now that's early July. Turning back the clock, um, we trace the origins of the Civil War to the reception of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December uh, 1921, no no negotiated, as we know, on the Irish side, mainly by Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. Uh, Cormac and Michal uh, will be dealing with this in relation to the positions taken uh, by their subjects, uh, Mellows and O'Malia. Uh, for those who opposed the treaty, including Eamon de Valera, Liam Mellows, the treaty had been signed under duress, under threat of, quote, immediate and terrible war uh, from Lloyd George. For those who supported it, um, it was a stepping stone to full freedom. Other objections raised in the th treaty debates in Dáil Éireann were to the limitations of sovereignty uh, in the treaty, the control by Britain of three Irish ports, the oath that office holders had to take to the English monarch, the role of the governor general representing the same monarch, and the acceptance of partition. Partition, though, was not the key objection. Many were persuaded that the Boundary Commission under established under the treaty uh, would resolve it. As the debates were going on, a conservative interests in society pressurised waverers uh, to support the treaty, business, the Catholic Church, large farmers, the press, uh, including the Tribune that I quoted. Ultimately, the treaty was uh, accepted by a small majority of Dáil deputies, 64 to 57 in January 1922. The minority walked out of the Dáil, copper fastening the emerging split. Another step towards establishing the legitimacy of the settlement was a general election of June 1922, the so-called pact election, in which a considerable majority of those elected supported the treaty, although the question wasn't put as such. Just a week later, the shooting war uh, commenced at the Four Courts. Before that, though, 
Um, there were some efforts already, there were some efforts at state building, notably uh, reform of the welfare system. We're in County Galway, so I should mention one particular element of that. Uh, notwithstanding the rhetoric uh, from the democratic program, um, there was uh, the uh, reform of the welfare system which was taking place uh, in this uh, period was a cost-saving exercise with religious bodies recruited to do things on the cheap. Uh, while Collins and co were negotiating the treaty in London, Galway County Council was discussing the establishment of what became the mother, the Chewham Mother and Baby Home. While the treaty debates were going on, the first group of mothers and children were being given over to the care of the Bon Secours uh, sisters, initially in Glenamaddy. So that's going on. But more generally, between January and June, there was simmering conflict with pro and anti-treaty factions securing positions around the country. Some old scores were being settled. For example, two RIC sergeants, ex-RIC sergeants, and a former public official were shot dead at St. Bride's home in the city in mid-March 1922. There was much social conflict already also in those months uh, in the, uh, between the, um, the, 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 the vote on the treaty and uh, the civil war. Land seizures uh, by tenant farmers and uh, labour discontent. discontent. In the outbreak of so-called Munster, of the Munster Soviets, up to a hundred, not a thousand, a hundred creameries and other installations were occupied and operated by unionised workers. There were other social conflicts, including some sparked by the housing crisis in urban Ireland, plus a change, uh, you might say, uh, during a so-called Galway Soviet about housing in May 1922, councillors were evicted from the council chamber, unoccupied houses were seized and homeless people placed in them, and the iconic statue of Lord Dunkellen in Air Square was removed on the basis that it represented landlordism. Much of this social unrest at the time was about disappointed hopes. It appeared that the promise of fundamental social change in the proclamation and the democratic programme was not going to be delivered. And with the winding up of the Republican courts, it seems that legal affairs were going back to the way they had been before the struggle. Uh, from prison, as we'll hear, uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, Liam Mellows advocated that the anti-treatyites align themselves with uh, social struggles, uh, but he wasn't heeded. Now, when Michael Collins issued an ultimatum to anti-treatyites occupying the four courts a week after the election that I've mentioned, he did so under pressure from the British and carried out his threat with borrowed British artillery. artillery. Historians, of course, lament the loss of 700 years of state documents during the three days that followed. The anti-treatyite stand in the centre of Dublin was reminiscent of 1916 and arguably was unwise from a strategic point of view. The Battle of Dublin continued for a few days after the fall of the Four Courts, but by early July, the Free State was in control of the capital. On paper, the anti-treatyites had an advantage at the outset, with the IRA overwhelmingly against the treaty. As against that, the anti-treaty force was poorly equipped, and many in the IRA were reluctant to fight a civil war. On the other side, Collins had the support of most of the IRB. He had the levers of state power, access to British military hardware, and he had the capacity to recruit a professional army. With its resources, the Free State was able to follow up on its Dublin victory, securing the cities of Waterford and Limerick and, and Cork in the second week of August uh, 22. After that, the anti-treaty forces were on the defensive, retreating into flying columns, and after the deaths of Collins and Griffiths later in August, faced an, uh, an increasingly ruthless government, uh, one indication of which was the decision to start executing prisoners, which will be uh, discussed uh, shortly. A few figures before concluding. Uh, John Dorney estimates 1,600 were killed in the Civil War, 800 Free State soldiers, 500 anti-treaty and 300 civilians. Another 350, we know, were killed in pogroms and other violence in the territory of Northern Ireland. Casualties were relatively low by comparison with other conflicts of the era, about 40,000 
uh, died in the Civil War in Finland in 1918. A final statistic, about 11,000 uh, anti-treaty Republicans were imprisoned by the, free, uh, by the uh, provisional government and the Free State during the Civil War. Getting back to where I started with the Tribune's prediction of bitterness, as, which was a safe enough prediction in the circumstances. The greatest bitterness in the aftermath surrounded the executions policy, I think it would be fair to say. I grew up in North Galway. My father was the generation born around the time of the struggle for independence. So there was a distance, um, uh, a reasonable distance at least from the Civil War. In my own memory, one episode still resonated powerfully, and that was the execution in April uh, 1923 of six, uh, six captured anti-treatyites uh, at the Chewham Workhouse, uh, Sean Maguire, Martin Mylan, Frank Conan, John Ewell, Seamus O'Malley and uh, Michael Monaghan. Most were captured at Cluge, the next townland to the one that I grew up in. Uh, and that's probably part of the reason for the lingering bit bitterness. But uh, it was also, I think, uh, from talking to older people, um, uh, due to what was perceived as uh, vindictiveness, that the conflict was practically over and that most of those executed held no uh, significant rank. Of course, there's another perspective on the question. And you'll hear more about uh, that and uh, other matters from our two speakers. So I can uh, leave it here. So uh, we can start uh, then uh, with uh, Michal O'Faherty, who's going to uh, talk about, um, about Parco Moy. So, right, thank you. <laughs> Gia Grieve, Agus, Gaurav Mahagat, John, um, Asna, Narea Vokal. It's a great privilege for me to be here with you this afternoon to speak about Parik Omalia. And what I want to try to do over the next 25 minutes or so uh, is two things. I want to give you a rounded sense of the man himself, his public life, his political career. And I also then want to reflect on his relationship with uh, Liam Mellows. Porik Omalia was uh, born just to the east of Leenan in the northwestern part of County Galway, um, which I think it's fair to say and is universally recognised as the most beautiful part of not just Galway but of Ireland in general. Uh, full disclosure here, I originate from Leenan myself, um, so there may, may, or not, may or may not be a little bit of subjectivity at play here. It was his place of origin and mine that prompted my interest in Porik Omalia about 20 years ago and the two of us have been on the road together ever since so I feel like this is a real culmination here appropriately enough uh, in the capital of our county. So Porik was born onto a farm that was approximately 350 acres in extent on a townland called Winchester Owen which is in the idyllic Glanamwam of the Man Valley just to the east of Leenan. Obviously that sounds like a very large farm, but I want to be explicit in saying that it would be unfair to characterise the Omalias as big farmers. 350 acres in North Connemara is not 350 acres in South Kilkenny. Most of the, most of the farm would have been upland, and most of it would have been a sheep walk. Nonetheless, the Omalias were, relatively speaking, better off than other people in the locality, where the average farm size would have been approximately 12 acres. As a consequence of this, um, the Omalias, Porik and his siblings, had the benefit of schooling and education, albeit one that was undertaken at home. As a consequence of that, in turn, Tomás, his brother, would go on to become Professor of Irish in Old School Nagalava, and as was mentioned earlier, I would really recommend you check out the exhibition dedicated to him that's currently um, there at the foyer of the Hardiman building. Also, another brother, Eamon, would go on and qualify as an engineer and work laterally with the Department of Local Government. Now, Amalia was the farmer, um, but the fact was that by the turn of the 20th century, it was really his um, political life that um, really characterised the man. Um, he was very much involved in the Irish Ireland movement, primarily uh, in the cultural movement. So he was a Timra, an organiser for Conor na uh, at a provincial level for Connacht from the turn of the 20th century. And he would go on then in 1911 to sit on its executive committee, the Kishtagno. 
Um, he was at the same time, though, very much um, distinguishing himself in nationalist politics as well. So he was a precocious member of Sinn Féin in that he joined it not long after it was founded in 1905. Of course, Sinn Féin would go on to become the big Republican behemoth that would take on the legacy of the 1916 Rising 10 years later. But at this stage, it was a very small, radical um, Irish nationalist political party that espoused, for instance, protectionism as an antidote to Ireland's economic shortcomings and a dual monarchy with Britain as an antidote to reconcile the aspirations of Ireland and Britain in a mutually satisfactory way. So um, in joining Sinn Féin, Porrig O'Malley was, was very definitely an outlier and, and demonstrating that he was cutting his own nationalist dash. He complemented this uh, in 1914 in becoming an early member of the Irish Volunteers in the west of Ireland. And needless to say, he um, aligned himself with that wing of the vo volunteers that opposed Britain's war effort, that did not answer John Redmond's call to support Britain during the First World War, he pledged himself to Owen MacNeill's uh, minority Irish volunteers, which rededicated themselves to the pursuit of Irish independence. And it was in this context that he first came into the orbit of Liam Mellows. So Liam Mellows and him in County Galway, they reorganised MacNeill's volunteers from, from the split um, up until the 1916 Rising. And as is known, and as Cormac will discuss in a moment, uh, Liam Mellows organised a sympathetic Rising here in Galway that uh, paralleled what was going on in Dublin in April 1916. And Amalia would uh, take his place beside Mellows in that respect. Um, he was charged with um, organising a rebellion in Connemara. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't get off the ground and he was arrested here in Galway City. And that began for Porrick O'Malley then, a protracted period of incarceration, intermittent but protracted nonetheless. So he was first deported to Britain where he was um, placed in Wandsworth Prison in London. Subsequently he was transferred to the um, famous, or in some ways notorious, Frongoch internment camp in Merionethshire in North Wales. And thereafter again to Reading Jail before coming back to Ireland. Now, um, unlike so many of the other men who had been interned after the 1916 Rising, O'Malley would be rearrested um, in Ireland and deported to Britain a second time in 1917. This time he was placed in Kington internment camp in Herefordshire uh, on the borders between England and Wales. Um, he escaped from there and made his way back to Ireland for a second time. And he should actually have been arrested yet again in 1918. At that point in time, the British authorities were alleging that Irish Republicans were conducting an illicit relationship with Imperial Germany, which of course was Britain's enemy on the field of battle. And they alleged this as the basis to round up persons of interest, people like Porrick O'Malley. So when some RIC officers tried to apprehend him and his brother Eamon, um, in Galway in 1918. Um, he fought back, he showed forcible resistance himself and his brother Eamon, so they weren't deported to Britain this time, and instead, uh, as far as historians are concerned, this was the opening salvo of the War of Independence in West Galway. Thereafter, Porrick had to go on the run. Um, and it's been mentioned already, but it's worth uh, emphasizing that uh, during his time on the run, Porrick spent a lot of time in a cave in Glanglosh, just, to, just, just, just adjacent uh, to Leenan. And if for anybody who hasn't taken a hike up there to inspect it for themselves, it's, it's well worth the pilgrimage. The cave was actually constructed by his brother Eamon, who, as I mentioned, was an engineer. Um, and it's, it's quite the feat and, and quite an interesting piece of industrial architecture dating from the revolutionary period. Now, um, as well as being on the run, um, Porrick nonetheless found time to re-engage with what was happening um, within the national movement. So he was, on the purely political front, elected the MP for uh, Connemara, Galway Connemara, um, in the 1918 general election, which of course was the election in which Sinn Féin swept the boards here in Ireland, utterly displacing the Irish Parliamentary Party. 
This was a Sinn Féin, of course, who, which had, following the 1916 Rising, adopted a Republican manifesto. So uh, Sinn Féin now had this mandate from the majority of the Irish people for the recognition of the Irish Republic as proclaimed in 1916. And Porrick O'Malley spoke for the people of Connemara, Galway, as indeed Liam Mellows did for the people of East Galway. Um, he was also involved in the reformed Irish Volunteers, which was now um, evolving into the Irish Republican Army. And the West Connemara Brigade of the IRA would have its headquarters at the O'Malley family home, Mounter Owen House. Um, it would have an active service unit, a flying column, and O'Malley would participate in this. The War of Independence, as I'm sure a lot of you know, really intensified in its second year. So it began um, in 1919, but it was really in 1920, 1921 that it escalated. Of course, this coincided with the deployment of the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. So Galway and Mayo were really drawn into the War of Independence during this phase. And in early 1921, in April 1921, there was a celebrated encounter between Crown forces and the West Connemara Brigade at Mount Rowan House in the Man Valley. It lasted 12 hours, um, and during which um, auxiliaries were deployed as well, and the West Connemara Brigade made their escape, but um, the O'Malley's house would be burned down in reprisal by the Crown forces, and sadly, Porrick would never return to live in the family homestead. Chronologically speaking, we were now getting to the point of truce. The truce between um, the Irish rebels and the British government would be agreed in July 1921. The negotiations on the Anglo-Irish Treaty would begin in October. Uh, as an aside, it's important to say that during this interregnum, Porrick uh, Amalia found time to marry Eileen Acton um, of uh, Cladadoff. When the treaty negotiations began, um, they would last between October and December, and then on the 6th of December 1921, a five-man uh, Sinn Féin delegation, led by Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, would sign off on the treaty with their British counterparts, a delegation led by British Prime Minister David Lloyd George. And I won't rehearse the details of the treaty, I'm sure they're very familiar to us all now at this point in time, but nonetheless, it's important to stress uh, the headline uh, facts about the treaty so that we can orientate ourselves in terms of the paths that both Amalia and Mellows took subsequently. So the Anglo-Irish Treaty granted Ireland substantive independence, but with two big qualifications. We can say with the benefit of hindsight that it cemented the partition of Ireland. And what it also did was that it maintained or institutionalised uh, to an even greater extent constitutional, ongoing constitutional connections between Britain and Ireland. So the British monarch, for instance, as John mentioned, would remain head of the newly independent Irish state when it came into being. And Irish politicians, those TDs sitting in Dáil Éireann, they would have to swear an oath of fidelity to his Britannic majesty. And this is, of course, what rankled with Sinn Féin. So when the treaty was brought back to be debated between December 1921 and January 1922, this was the main bone of contention um, between the emergent factions within Sinn Féin in Dáil Éireann, was whether it was pragmatically acceptable to accept uh, these trammels to Irish independence, this oath of fidelity, or whether it was unacceptable as Irish Republicans, could this be tolerated? So that provided the basis for the discourse uh, over those 15 days of debate between December and January 19, December 1921 and January 1922. Now, as John mentioned, and again, as, as everybody knows, in January 1922, when the division happened, it was a very narrow split. So 64 of the Sinn Féin TDs voted for the treaty and 57 voted against the treaty. So 64 to approve it, 57 uh, to throw it out. Porrick O'Malley was one of the 64 who endorsed the treaty. Liam Mellows was one of the 57 who voted against it. Now, when we look at this split, and I'm going to be reflecting on this um, considerably over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, 
We have, as, as Irish people, and more specifically as Irish historians, we have looked very closely at this division, and we've tried to make sense of the dynamics within this split. However, it's very much my personal contention, based on my own research, that the division within Dáil Éireann in January 1922 was very much an arbitrary rupture. There was no ideological division or fissure that had been buried beneath Sinn Féin that was revealed by this split in January 1922. What you actually had were two cohorts of people. Uh, one cohort that simply believed that the treaty was the best that was on offer, and another cohort that believed the fight had to continue um, given the, the moral mandate behind the Republic. And this is very clear when you look at the text of the treaty debates, and I would encourage people to do that, and a lot of it is reproduced in, in the wonderful exhibitions in, in the Galway City Museum. If you walk upstairs from the Amalia Mellows exhibition, you'll find a wider ex ex exhibition, and some of the texts from the debates are, are reproduced there. And hats off again to Brendan McGowan and his team for putting together some really wonderful exhibitions at a time when, you know, Ireland is congested with exhibitions on the revolution. They've done a terrific job in, in carving out their own niche and revealing what I would consider to be salient aspects that aren't addressed elsewhere. So when you look at these texts, what you'll see is that um, in many ways, both pro and anti-treaty TDs were very much on the same page when it came to the treaty. Porico Malia spoke about the treaty with no love, all right? Um, he believed that the treaty should be accepted simply because there was no alternative. But he did not as such endorse the treaty as the settlement of the, you know, the, the, the Irish nationalist question for once and for all. He cited as well his constituents' wishes that the treaty be accepted, and he respected their wishes. That is what he stated explicitly. Likewise, Liam Mellows did not love the treaty, it goes without saying. And he also took cognizance of what his constituents uh, wanted as well. He interpreted things slightly differently, though. He saw that the people, or he felt that the people, it wasn't that they wanted the treaty um, any more than the TDs. They were just war weary and they wanted peace. And he felt that people like him should have the courage to persist um, and, and get ultimate recognition for the Irish Republic. The, the anti treatyites as well have been portrayed often in certain quarters as anti democrats. But Liam Mellows made the very compelling point that he was elected in 1918, in 1921, as a Republican, um, very, very specifically as a Republican. So to back away from the Republic in 1922 was an abrogation of his moral responsibility. So sadly, we had this really um, arbitrary rupture, as I said, between men and women who fundamentally were very much on the same page, committed to the recognition of the Irish Republic. As John mentioned, over the succeeding months from January 1922, there was an attempt made by both sides to try to foster common ground once again, to try to achieve a rapprochement. Porico Malia sat on a 10-member committee um, in spring 1921 that sought to do exactly that. Unfortunately, though, of course, events would overtake them, and in June 1922, the Civil War would be joined. And this is now when Omalia and Mellows, their legacy really comes into sharp perspective, because, of course, things would be very dramatic for both individuals now over the coming months as we reach the end of 1921. Porik Omalia for better or for worse, in October 1921, voted in favour of special powers legislation in the Dáil, which empowered the provisional government to establish military courts um, and um, deal with anti-treaty recalcitrants in a very brutal way. On foot of this legislation, on foot of these courts, 77 anti-treaty Republicans would, of course, be killed including, as John mentioned, one of Parik O'Malley's own constituents and namesake, Seamus O'Malley from Uttarard. It was because of this, it was because O'Malley had supported the Special Powers legislation that when he and Sean Hales were motoring along the North Dublin Quays um, in December 1921, the anniversary is coming up this Wednesday, on the 7th of December 1921, they were singled out by anti-treaty Republicans for uh, an assassination attempt. Uh, Amalia was believed to be the prime target because he had voted for the legislation. Hales was absent that day. 
Um, but it was Sean Hales who was actually assassinated. Porik Amalia uh, suffered gunshots to the spine, but he survived. In reprisal for this then, and this was supremely ironic and really, you know, just a happen chance occurrence. The provisional government took the decision to execute four prominent anti-treaty figures, one of which, of course, was Porik Amalia's own comrade in arms, Liam Mellows. So when people reflect on Omalia and Mellows, this is how they reflect on them, as bitter adversaries um, who, you know, who committed themselves to a ruthless civil war. And in one case, Liam Mellows paid the ultimate price. In another case, Omalia only barely escaped with his, lives, with his life. But I would contend that, um, especially now, as we reflect on these two individuals um, at the centenary, of, uh, of, of this attack and of, this, uh, of, of the death of Liam Mellows, that we need to look beyond uh, the events of the latter part of December 1921. And I would contend that the first portion of Mellows and Amalia's life, that portion of their life where they were committed to the same cause and worked hand in hand, actually this is the way that we need to frame our memory of these two men. And what I think gives heft to my argument as well is if you look at the latter career of Porik Amalia, who would survive, of course, up until 1946. I would contend that when you drill down into the detail of Omalia's life, you see that he actually put himself back on a trajectory that coincided very much with the trajectory of Liam Mellows. So in the 1920s, the headline data when it comes to Porik Omalia is that he was one of the drafters of the constitution of the new pro-treaty party, Common and Oil, in 1923. He sat as last Count Corlea of the Free State Doll between 1923 and 1927. And this would seem to cast him as the archetypal pro-treaty TD. Um, and when he has been remembered, that has been the tendency to, to, to remember him in those terms. But if you look more closely at his political career during that era, you find a very, very different um, course. In 1924, some officers in the new Irish army mutinied against the Commonwealth administration because they believed that it was coming to love the treaty. It was coming to be a free state institution. And they were not happy about this. They had bought into Michael Collins's perspective that the treaty was a stepping stone to ultimate freedom. And these officers felt that that was being betrayed. Omalia courageously sided with these officers, him and a cabal of Commonwealth TDs. Uh, they were known uh, colloquially as the National Group. And as I said, this was courageous because he was going against the established administration, an administration that had proven itself um, quite willing to be ruthless when necessity dictated. Uh, and he was expelled subsequently from the Commonwealth Party. Uh, thereafter, he co-founded a new political party in 1926 called Clon Éireann, and it had as its explicit purpose the desire to create a bridge between Common and Wales and the newly emergent anti-treaty party Fianna Fáil. And when Clon Éireann didn't get off the ground, uh, thereafter again, O'Malley took an even more decisive step back towards um, his and Mello's original agenda. He walked across the house and he joined Fianna Fáil. Now, this could be seen as an opportunistic move because Fianna Fáil were the party in the ascendant, Common and Whale were starting to stagnate. But for O'Malley to do that, it was a tremendously courageous endeavour, as I said, because he was now shunned by those in Common and Whale, but he was also not welcomed by those within Fianna Fáil. When he joined the party in Dublin, um, it was against considerable resistance. He had built a new house for himself and his family near Ratoth in County Meath, and this house was the wonder of the locality in the late 1920s because it had to be built to be bomb-proof. Such was the threat um, against his life. So it was, no, you know, it was no pragmatic thing when he joined Fianna Fáil. He joined Fianna Fáil because he felt now that the credentials of republicanism were being betrayed by Common and Whale. So as I said, this brought him back into political alignment with Liam Mellows. But it doesn't end there. 
Lee Mellows was not just a political revolutionary, he was, as John mentioned, and as uh, Cormac will elaborate, I'm no sure, a social revolutionary as well. He wanted Irish independence to mean not just the emancipation of the nation, but the emancipation of the people of the nation, the poor people, the small farmers, for instance, of the west of Ireland. And O'Malia didn't just um, endorse this line himself, but he actively pursued it. So in the 1920s, the Cumberland Wales government um, through the Land Commission, took over those large farms in the Man Valley, like the O'Malia family home. Um, and O'Malia, Porrick O'Malia, did not protest against this, even though this was his family homestead, even though his people had lived on it since the great O'Malley clan had been forced out of Morrisk in the, uh, in the 16th, 17th century. Um, other families in the valley who had their land taken, they protested. He deliberately did not do that because it was the right thing he felt. Ever since the 1910s, he had believed fervently that smaller farmers uh, in the west of Ireland needed to be helped in whatever way they could. And if that meant breaking up such large farms as there were, then this needed to happen, even if that meant his own family farm. He was compensated, it's important to say, um, with land in Meath where that house was built. Um, but the fact was, he did not want to leave um, his beloved west of Ireland. Um, so this demonstrated uh, a huge commitment to a degree of social engineering. When we look as well at the fact that even before the Land Commission intervened to buy this farm, he had been very vocal in Dáil Éireann that Patrick Hogan, who was the Minister for Agriculture, his 1923 Land Act had provided for the confiscation and division of this land. And the Cumberland and Wales government in general was not in favour of this. They wanted to maintain the large farms. But uh, Porrick O'Malia was very vociferous in the Dáil that the land, particularly in the west of Ireland, belonging to bigger farmers like himself, it should be taken and it should be divided. Subsequently, too, um, as we move now into the 1930s, into the last act of Porrick O'Malia's public life, he would become a very prominent figure within farming circles. And when de Valera nominated him to the Shannad in the 1930s, he would sit on the agriculture panel. But unlike all the other prominent voices within Irish agriculture in the 1930s, Porrick O'Malley advocated for the small farmer. He set up an organisation called the United Farmers Protection Association, which advocated a new configuration of Irish agriculture, configured more in favour of smaller farmers. And of course, that was the agenda with which, uh, which Fianna Fáil pursued during the, uh, the 1930s. I can't stress enough that at this time, every major farmer, uh, prominent farmer within the Irish Farmers Union, for instance, that spoke within the Farmers Party, they were all large farmers and they all advocated for the maintenance of the status quo, the configuration that favoured the larger farmers. So Porrick O'Malia um, demonstrated, a, again, a degree of courage in challenging the hegemony um, with, uh, within Irish farming, whilst continuing to be a farmer himself, uh, quite, quite a big farmer um, at that rate. So um, I don't want to overstay my time now. Um, so just to, to draw to a conclusion, what I've been saying. The centenary, um, which we are now coming to the end of, of the revolution, and, and Cormac and I were talking about how that's actually, I think, uh, gives us all pause for a big sigh of relief um, at, this, at this point in time. Um, the centenary, though, has been very useful. It's concentrated all of our minds on the revolutionary epoch, and it's particularly concentrated the minds of historians to re-look and to re-examine this history. And when you look at the history of Porrick O'Malia and Liam Mellows, um, what I firmly believe that you see is that what we were you know, led to believe for, for, for decades about the two sides in the treaty divide has in many ways misrepresented that divide. There's no doubt that subsequently Fianna Fáil and Cumberland Wales slash Fine Gael went on different trajectories and you know, found different agendas. But there was, at the very start, no real ideological rift within the Sinn Féin movement. What you had was a movement characterised by a solidarity based around a patriotic principle, based around a practical patriotic uh, principle. I'm going to say something now that you won't hear most professional historians say. 
I'm going to say that I admire this generation. For a long time after independence, there was a kind of a romantic reflection on this generation, which you know, misrepresented them in its own right. Then we had the revisionist reinterpretation of these people, um, which was quite critical of this generation and even denigrated them. But now, today, with all of the sources that we have at our disposal, um, and thankfully with you know, a lot of the unresolved political issues um, from the Civil War and indeed from the Northern Ireland Troubles resolved, we can go back with a degree <coughs> excuse me, of maturity and look at this period. And when we look at this period, we find women and men who were admirable in every way. And I certainly see Pora Kamalia and Leah Mellows as admirable people. I'm taking kind of a slightly different uh, take uh, from uh, Michal in terms of I'm going to start at the end of Liam Mellows' life um, uh, and start with the, the, the early hours of the morning of the 8th of December 1922 when Mellows was woken up, told that he was to be executed along with three others, Joe McElvey, Dick Barrett and Rory O'Connor uh, as a reprisal for the shooting uh, the previous uh, uh, day of Sean Hales, the fatal shooting of Sean Hales and the wounding of Park Amalia, both pro-treaty TDs. Now, the, uh, the legality of the executions was challenged by Labour and the Dáil, for example, uh, but also by the Hales family themselves, who uh, wrote to the media to tell them that they supported in no way the execution of the four men, including Mellows, uh, were critical of the executions and um, uh, or aghast that their, the, the death of their own son and brother was being used as uh, an excuse for a reprisal of, of this nature. Kevin O'Higgins uh, um, dismissed uh, discussions about the legality of the executions, whether or not they were justified, uh, with a statement that the safety and preservation of the people is the highest law. And uh, as was mentioned uh, before this uh, by both uh, the lads, uh, the executions embittered uh, a great many people, and uh, when we look at the, uh, the final letters of Liam Mellows, um, he refers to the possibly the impact of these executions and government policy on, uh, on those people who were previously in Sinn Féin and the IRA who supported the government and supported the treaty at this point. So, um, the final letters written by these Republicans are extremely uh, interesting for a number of different reasons. Firstly, they engage in a number of key things. They tried to console their relatives. There was expressions of love. Uh, they gave explanations for their actions and justifications, and they issued appeals to their comrades. While their letters couldn't possibly have included every single thought that went through their minds, they are worth studying, studying for the thoughts that they did include and did put down on paper in their final hours. So uh, an issue regarding the execution of Mellows and the three others is, why those men in particular were selected. And no real proper explanation was ever given. They had been in jail for half a year. They had no direct or indirect involvement in the targeting of Hales and Amalia. And they had very, very little impact on the direction that the Republican uh, policy was taking as the Civil War progressed. Um, Desmond Greaves, the historian, who wrote a, a, a biography of Mellows uh, about 50 years ago, he described uh, when those four tongues were silenced, the world became safer for official history. And one of the theories for why Mellows and the three others were selected was the fact that they'd been introduced, uh, they'd been involved in secret negotiations and discussions and talks, uh, members of the IRB uh, and members of the upper echelons of the uh, leadership of the Republican movement previous and prior to the Civil War. Uh, and one theory was that it suited people on the pro-treaty side that these men would be executed, executed and that their whatever secrets they had would, would be brought to the grave. Another suggestion, uh, a common suggestion uh, in the community was that they represented the four provinces. Joe McKelvey was an Ulster man, Dick Barrett uh, a Munster man, Roy O'Connor for Leinster, and Mellows then for Connacht. Now, Mellows had been a TD for Galway, uh, but had lost his seat in the June 1922 election. He had taken part in, and led the Easter Rising in, in County Galway, but it's difficult to imagine that a, a, a government determined to establish its own nationalist credentials would have 
ultimately selected him uh, on the basis that he had led the East Rising of Galway, and that would be used as a reason to execute him. Another suggestion that was made over the years was that uh, the government was afraid of Mellows' political rag, uh, radicalism and his strength and potential source of leadership in Repub within republicanism. Because Mellows, over the course of the Civil War and even before that, had started to move to the left. And uh, asked by Ernie O'Malley um, to formulate his ideas and theories on, on the military struggle and the political struggle, Mellows uh, began to write uh, and commit to paper uh, what he thought uh, would be a, a way of mobilizing uh, the working class and the lower middle class to support the Republican cause. Because they and uh, other leaders essentially felt the natural, natural constituency for the Republican movement was the, though, uh, were those social classes, the poorer off in society. And at the same time, Mellows and others basically felt and disagreed with Liam Lynch's uh, interpretation uh, Lynch was a, the, the leader of the IRA during the Civil War, and he basically felt we have to focus exclusively on the military side. Uh, Mellows and the others th uh, thought that without a, so uh, a social program, without an economic program, that the Civil War and a struggle from the Republican point of view was doomed to failure. So, anyways, these, letter, these uh, notes from Mountjoy, as they became to be known, they were smuggled out of Mountjoy, and they were captured, and they were publicised uh, in the national media, which was exclusively pro-treaty. Now, what did Mellows uh, argue in favour of? Um, Mellows argued that the wealth and the property of the country should be used for the, wor uh, for the workers' and farmers' benefit. He argued that banks and communications, the communications uh, system, should be controlled by the people. And another argument that he made was that the land of the aristocracy uh, should be divided in such a way as to maximise the amount of people who could live comfortably on the land. He was happy, and he declared this himself, he was happy to see the wealthy suffer because they were essentially pro-treaty. Their links to Britain, their economics links to Britain, were one of the reasons that the, that the treaty was accepted, and he was delighted to see that the social class that was most strongly identified with the treaty would be made to suffer through having their property seized and divided amongst the workers and the poor and the worse off. Um, as I said, the press was highly critical. So for example, the Freeman Journal, the Freeman's Journal criticized and condemned this plan as to fall back on a plan of fooling a section of the people with bribes to be paid by taking from another section of the people. And we have to remember uh, when we look at Ireland at this time, when Europe, it's in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, uh, there's uh, upheaval on the continent in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, rebellions by various socialist and left-wing and communist groups. And there was no certainty that Ireland themselves, and Ireland as a country couldn't fall under the spell of communism or socialism uh, um, uh, threatening the status quo, both economic, social and political. So anyway, about, at about five o'clock in the morning of the 8th of December 1922, Mello sat down and wrote his final farewell to his mother. Um, he had previously declared that the Catholic Church was invariably wrong, uh, in, uh, invariably wrong in Ireland in their political outlook, uh, justifying their, their repu the Republican refusal to accept the, uh, the theories and the arguments of the Catholic Church by referring to 1798, the Fenians, and the way that previous Republican movements had been hostile the church and the church had been vigorously opposed to their influence and their activities. Um, despite the fact that he was hostile to the Catholic Church, God was mentioned, for example, five times in his letter to his mother, um, a couple of times, all right, in uh, common expressions, but it, it also, the letter also showed how religious Mellows himself was. And he said, for example, at the end of the letter, my last thoughts would be on God and Ireland and you. He was optimistic about uh, the afterlife and told his mother that, you must not grieve, we should be reunited hereafter. But despite his relig religious conviction and, um, and thoughts on the afterlife, he was originally unwilling to compromise on the Republican position. Uh, the, the bishops had come out strongly in favor of the treaty in, in December of 1921, but in October 1922, 
they essentially condemned the Republican movement, excommunicated them, and supported fully uh, the new state. And as a result, they uh, delegitimized the Republican struggle, causing a massive rift between themselves and Republicans. Now, individual clergymen, significant numbers of them, were uh, sympathetic to the Republican cause, but unlike during the War of Independence, they had to do this privately because they were under threat of suspension in the event of them publicly coming out and endorsing the Republican uh, side of the Civil War. Mellows originally refused to see a clergyman, or at least to uh, accept the, the sacraments before he was executed, but it seems, according to Desmond Greaves, that some sort of fudge uh, uh, happened before uh, his, uh, he was to be ultimately be, to be executed in a way that was acceptable both to himself and to the clergyman, uh, uh, and uh, that he did re receive the sacraments. But that was a cause, again, of tremendous bitterness, um, the thoughts that men were to be executed and in their final moments, that rather than be given the sacra sacraments, that they would be asked to uh, betray their political principles. Right, um, Mellows was optimistic about the future of the Republican struggle. He said, we die for truth, vindication will come. He seems to have clearly believed, like in 1916, that the uh, executions of Republicans would have a galvanizing effect on fellow, fellow Republicans, uh, but also, would perhaps prick the conscience of those who are on the other side of the treaty debate and maybe cause some of them to change sides. And during the course of the Civil War, we talk about executions of Republican prisoners, but one of the groups particularly targeted for selection during execution were previously uh, pro-treaty soldiers who had changed sides. Some of them um, fairly, uh, fairly late on in the, Civil War, in the Civil War. And one of the reasons why some pro-treaty uh, uh, soldiers defected uh, was um, those executions. They were disgusted by them uh, and they were betrayed by them. So, for example, in this period of December 1922, deserters uh, had been executed um, for changing sides. Now, um, he was convinced, anyway, that re previous Republicans, Republicans who had been on both sides of the treaty debate, um, but had previously served together to the War of Independence, um, he was convinced that they would become brothers once more. In this belief, I die happy, he said. The Republic lives, our deaths make that a certainty. Now, given the sheer numbers of people involved in the pro-treaty side who had, been, uh, um, who had been members of the IRA and the IRB, that was a significant threat to the new state and the, establish and the, uh, the ability of the new state to survive the Civil War. Um, one other uh, issue that he raised in the course of his letters was the issue of reprisal. And bear in mind that he himself was being executed as a reprisal for the, killings, for the killing of Hales. During the War of Independence, in response to attacks on civilians and Republicans by the Crown forces, Republicans shot prisoners and they, uh, and they burned uh, big houses. Uh, and this, there was a certain amount of disquiet about this uh, within Republicans. And during the Civil War, the same and the similar debate took place about whether or not, for example, uh, supporters of the government should be targeted in, re in reprisal. Uh, so, for example, in the First, West, uh, First Western Division in Clare and South Galway, um, uh, Frank Barrish, the Republican, uh, leading Republican officer, refused point blank, for example, to burn big houses as a reprisal for executions. But in other areas, large houses were burnt. Uh, and sometimes captured soldiers were shot as a, as a response to executions by the Free State. Uh, now, Mellows himself said, let no thought or revenge or reprisal animate Republicans. Much like the Hales, he despised the idea that his death would be used as an opportunity or an excuse to shoot people from the, from the other side. Shooting a man, uh, as Joe Sweeney said, a leading officer uh, in the Free State Army, shooting a man in, uh, during the course of a battle is one thing, shooting a man in cold blood is another. Um, now, one of the things that, that Republicans talk about uh, when they try to understand why within a, a family uh, somebody might become a more active Republican than in another, fam another family, another part of the family, or another part of the area, uh, is family and uh, geography. Where uh, geography has an impact on the development of political consciousness. And it can it's, it's very, very difficult to say why 
one person became an activist and why one person didn't. Why one person, as Michal said, became pro-treaty, why another uh, went anti-treaty. On the face of it, uh, Mellows would seem to have been an unlikely Republican. Uh, he came from a family with a tradition of service in the British Army, and apparently it was hoped that he would go on uh, and also join the British Army. As a child, however, he was sent down to his mother's family in Wexford, and this is, would have been at the time of the 100th anniversary of, uh, the, the, 100th anniversary of uh, the 1798 Rebellion. And this was extreme, this was still alive in Wexford. Um, this, this kind of folk memory of repression, of, re, of reprisals, of attacks by the Crown forces. And also on the other side, uh, if, from a loyalist point of view, memory of activities of the rebels, attacks on loyalists and their homes. This was also alive. But uh, when people were looking to explain why Mellows later became a Republican, this is one of the instances that were, that were used to explain why uh, this might have happened. The influence of elderly people who would have known people in their childhood who had seen or who knew, knew people who were involved in the 1798 rebellion. Now again, this wouldn't expl uh, explain it by itself because plenty of young Wexford men went on to join the British Army, for example, in the First World War, served in the RIC and the Free State Army later on, for example. But Mellows goes on anyways, and he joins Fianna Éireann, a Republican uh, Boy Scout uh, organization. And this brings him to people, into contact with people like Countess Markovich. He becomes an organizer. He gets to know people like James Connolly. In common with uh, a lot of Republicans, he had a certain sympathy with the, uh, with the locked out workers of the 1913 lockout, without necessarily becoming a fully fledged socialist or activist himself. Um, in the aftermath, uh, of that, he sent down to Galway to help organise um, Republicans to take part in an upcoming rising that would happen at some point before the end of the First World War. And the IRB were determined, determined to use and to manipulate the Irish volunteers uh, so that to, to ensure that there would be a rising at some point before the end of the First World War. They'd missed the opportunity during the Boer War and they were determined to make sure that this didn't happen again. So, the uh, just before the rising occurs and starts in Easter Monday in Dublin, they get contradictory orders. The guns have been captured. Uh, the guns that Casement was to, to bring in from, uh, from Germany. Uh, o McNeil countermanded the, uh, the orders given uh, to take part in the rising through putting a, 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 basically a note in the Sunday Independent, uh, volunteers completely deceived, all maneuvers canceled. So Mellows now is in a quandary. And on the one hand, he's been told, carry on with the rising. On the other hand, uh, you know, messengers are being sent all around the country to tell people, stay at home, don't rebel, no matter what happens. And he asked a local Republican called Matty Nealon, he asked him, what do you think I should do? Couldn't make up his mind. And Nealon said, whatever you do, do it now. And Mello said, well, what do you think I should do? And Nealon said, if it was me, I'd go out. And they, and they, and they went out. It was the, and, Outside of the Dublin area, it was the only place of significant rebel activity during the course of, the, uh, during the course of, the, of Easter week. Now, Mellows, in the aftermath of the Rising, escapes to the States where he becomes certain, something of a celebrity amongst Irish Americans. Uh, his, his star uh, and his stock is rising within the Republican movement. He comes home. He becomes a TD for East Galway, the only one of the four constituencies not to have been con uh, con contested. Uh, he becomes uh, uh, a member of IRA General Headquarters, right, where he's involved in efforts to arm the IRA for the, for the escalating struggle that they're involved in. And then, in July of 1921, a truce comes into effect. Most Republicans regard it as a breathing space of a couple of weeks before the struggle continues again. But, as we said, Collins and Griffith and the, and the delegation are sent to, uh, to London, they sign a treaty, the treaty is brought home. Mellows was strongly opposed to the treaty. And he made a number of different arguments about the treaty. One of them was, um, that is not the will of the people, that is the fear of the people. That, they were, that, the, the, that people were being railroaded into supporting the treaty by the fear of war immediate and terrible that had been threatened by Lloyd George um, and the British delegation. Um, he also, as Michal said, was determined to 
showed that they weren't anti-democratic. He described the fact that the people gave a mandate for a republic to be, to be declared, and that this would uh, that you couldn't um, go back in this, uh, you know, the, it, just in terms of a dull vote, whatever. But what the, the people felt later on, uh, he was an internationalist more than merely uh, an, a, an Irish nationalist. So he hated the idea of empire. He was an ide ideologically, he was a Republican. And the thoughts of Ireland being involved in the empire and, in his words, to be involved in the crucifixion of India and the degradation of Egypt. As in, it wasn't merely, um, uh, his problem wasn't merely with a problem with uh, British rule in Ireland. It was a problem uh, with the British empire. Uh, he also referred to, he was cynical about the intentions of the British ruling class, criticizing, for example, the Treaty of Versailles uh, and uh, you know, sympathizing with those who had fought for a brave new world being betrayed by the, by, the, uh, by the political class in the aftermath of the First World War. Now, as the split increased between pro and anti-treaty Sinn Féin and pro and anti-treaty anti IRA, uh, the IRA itself began to split into various sort of factions. Uh, even those who were approved to the treaty and didn't all have, they didn't all have the same outlook in terms of how do we advance our cause. Mellows uh, was identified with, the, with one of the more uh, active groups and one of the more radical groups, the impatient uh, groups, if you like. Uh, despite that, he wasn't optimistic about their chances ultimately of success. Uh, for example, he said that we can do no more than, hold on, uh, than hand on the torch. And this is a common theme in Republicans that there was a morality in keep, keeping the struggle going even if there was no hope of success because you, you had no right to end uh, the struggle for a republic um, and deny a, f a further generation the opportunity to achieve that goal of the 32 country republic. How are we for time, John? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, another issue was touched on by John was um, the fact that some people were now coming out of the woodworks, woodwork to try and use political instability, use lack of policing as a way of furthering their own local or even national ends. Um, so at a, at a joint rally of pro and anti-treaty anti candidates and uh, prominent figures in Ballinasloe, Slow, where there was a kind of a flurry of uh, um, sectarian, act, uh, sectarian activity, uh, um, some of which was straightforwardly sectarian, some of which was economic. Uh, he declared that he stood for the complete independence, but not for the dom dominance of any particular creed in Ireland. Again, this, uh, the idea of uniting Catholic, Protestant and dissenter uh, together. His, uh, his motivation was not religious in any way, despite his own strongly held religious beliefs. He was an ideologically, to the, to his, uh, until his final days, he was a, a, a Republican. Now, one other aspect that uh, Mellows was involved in, uh, a significant aspect that has to be considered was in his, fi in his final days he was involved in efforts to destabilise the nor new Northern Ireland state where uh, members of both pro and anti-treaty forces would cooperate in an attack on the Northern state. Uh, and even in his final days in Dublin at the start of the Civil War he was involved sending nurses to the north, up to Donegal, that would be used uh, for an upcoming campaign, and a, a protracted campaign against the northern state. Republicans in the four courts where Mellows' group had gone in, and, and Mellows had been involved in efforts to destabilize, or to, to sort of, to stabilize the situation here, and to try and promote peace between both pro and anti-treaty forces. Uh, Republicans were so reluctant in the four courts to engage uh, in anything that might jeopardize that piece, uh, they, uh, that uh, when they sent guys out to get food to bring it into the forecourts, uh, they told them, make sure, no matter what happens, make sure you don't involve in, uh, get yourselves involved in a shooting match with people on the other side. They were, they were really, really fearful of that, and it affected their judgment in the lead up to the Civil War, because rumours are starting to circulate that a newly established government made up of pro-treaty Sinn Féiners was going to attack the fourth proposition. And even, the, even in the final hours, uh, they didn't take, opportunity, uh, take oppor um, advantage of the opportunities that were presented to them to maybe escape, to move out of the, the, out of the four courts, uh, or at least prepare uh, uh, themselves to be able to fight effectively against the forces that were, that were about to be deployed against them. Now, um, during 
and even during the fight uh, in the four courts when it was happening around the centre of Dublin, ties of comradeship remain strong with those of the other side. So at one point there was, there was a lull in the fighting and Mellows and a couple of the others met with, uh, serious, uh, with, with senior leaders on the other side. And uh, one of them was Paddy O'Daly, who was later a highly controversial figure in the Free State Army down in Kerry. And Mellows um, said to Paddy uh, O'Daly, he said to them, he said to him, he said, uh, when you're coming into us, Paddy, implying that the natural home for Paddy O'Daly was in the four courts rather than the other side. And O'Daly's answer was, tomorrow with bayonets. Um, and, um, and, and by the 30th of June, the fighting around the four courts was over. They were, uh, the leaders were arrested, they were imprisoned in Mountjoy, and half a year later, on the 8th of December, 1922, Mellows was woken from his sleep, told he was to be transferred to another cell, and himself, Joe McKelvey, Dick Parrott, and uh, Rory O'Connor were executed. Right.